Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Bob Bianchi. I'll be with you to 3 o'clock, and we're going to have a, another fascinating trial here, Georgia versus Frankie Gebhardt. It is a cold case homicide uh, from 1983. We've had opening statements and are now listening to the sisters' testimony. They're at lunch break. This is why I love this hour, because we have a lot of opportunity to bring great guests to you, like Kenya Johnson from Georgia herself, currently a prosecutor, always a great guest. Kenya, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, pleasure. So just real quick, give me uh, 30 seconds. Uh, you know, what's going on down there in Georgia with solving these cold case homicides? You guys did a great job. Uh, what do you think? Good case? Good opening for the prosecution? Strong? Sure. Uh, the opening was strong. Um, they promised a lot of things, and so we'll look forward to see whether they delivered those. Uh, Spalding County is about an hour outside of metro Atlanta, and while Atlanta is an national city, uh, Spalding County is rather rural, so it'll be interesting to see the developments in this trial. Wow, that's great to have your insights, uh, just even biographical, geographical information. But, Kenya, we're going to do a lot of talking, but we have to go to the top crime stories here at Law and Crime Network. And on the other side of that, we'll get back to you and some clips about what's occurred so far in case, and we'll break it down with you, Kenya. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. Uh, Kenya, I love those top crime stories. I always give you a little something in there about what's going on in the world. And we're yeah. always in a world of, of chaos. I always say it's a great opportunity to, to be an astute observer of human nature, the good, the bad, the ugly, especially when you're doing homicide work, especially when you're solving and hopefully getting a conviction as a prosecutor in a cold case from 1983. You're a prosecutor. You're down in Georgia, and you were giving us a little idea of uh, what the, it's like there. So tell me, what's the court like there? Is it more of a rural, urban, suburban? Uh, what's the, do you know anything about the judge? What's the attitude of the, uh, the whole scenario there? Well, I will share overall that Atlanta, which is the county seat, is a very metropolitan international city. However, if you go anywhere 50 miles outside of the metro area, you can pretty much be transformed back into another time. It's extremely rural. You'll see shotgun houses. Uh, even if you go to some of the older courthouses in the area, in the rural areas, uh, they even have a lynching stick still on the courthouse front lawn. And so you can see uh, remnants of history history, not so kind history in the past in some of these outlying jurisdictions. Yeah, it's amazing. And this particular case, the prosecutor's uh, theory has been from the beginning that this was a racially motivated homicide case uh, because of the victim in the case. Uh, was actually with a white woman, and there's all these vestiges of old school racism, like the use of the truck and a chain and dragging the guy, uh, brutalizing his body. Um, you know, we don't see that so much up here, at least uh, in my experience as a prosecutor for many years in, in New Jersey or New York. Uh, is, is this something that is still going on, do you think, these racially motivated murders like this? Well, occasionally you hear about specific instances, um, but I commend the Spalding County District Attorney for sticking with this case and for accepting this challenge of prosecuting such an older case. But while Spalding is still a rural area, uh, the demographics have changed, and uh, it is hopeful that it will be a more diverse jury and a jury that is more uh, repulsed by these activities than juries may have been in the past. Yeah, and Kenya, you know this as well as I do. I I've prosecuted in many jurisdictions. And, and even done defense work in many different counties within even one state. And the jury pool can be so substantially different from one county to the next that it actually changes the prosecutor or your dynamic as to how you try to case. And a lot of people don't get that. It's not just necessarily about the facts or the law, but it's a lot about the jury pool you have there. But Kenya, that's why you're great. You're from Georgia. You'll be able to break this case down more. But we want to give our viewers, go back a little bit to the prosecutor's opening statement. And both of us have Having been prosecutors ourselves and, and having done homicide work, I think we're going to have a great discussion in breaking down that opening. So we'll see you on the other end. All right. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. Wow, we just uh, were listening to the prosecutors, part of the prosecutors' opening statement. We're going to do more of that during this lunch hour break. Why I love being here is because we got people like Kenya who uh, not only is a, a still currently a prosecutor, which is awesome, she tried murder cases like myself, so we can break it down. Prosecutors in there, um, to me, Kenya, strong, uh, love her voice inflection. She's using all the tools. I mean, you know, you're not there just to read off a sheet. You're supposed to be animated, let the jury like you, let them feel comfortable when you're asking them to do something, which is convict somebody for something that happened in 1983, which usually means, folks out there in... Uh, 
in our uh, land. Uh, you are using witnesses that may not necessarily, in many cases, always be the most stellar witnesses. They're usually people coming forward with uh, a reason why they're there. So, Kenya, what do you think of the opening statement in terms of her demeanor in front of the jury? I definitely felt the passion from the prosecutor. Um, what's important to relate to the jury is that you believe in your own case, that you're not just doing this because it's an assignment, but you believe that the evidence will prove this. And this is a right that needs to be, a wrong that needs to be righted. So um, I definitely got that from the prosecutor. And the defense attorney is just, uh, you know, going to start with poking the holes. And um, that is more automatic. Uh, I'm not feeling the passion in the defense attorney, but um, I'm sure we'll see some more as time goes on. So, Kenny, you couldn't be a more perfect guest. Georgia law, I mean, it, it, the laws are usually very similar. They kind of different wording and they call it different things. But the, I like the prosecutor. And so the, the folks know out there, usually you're not allowed to comment on the law at least too much or the judge is going to kind of maybe thump you and say, hey, the law is what my responsibility is, not yours. But yet you have to tell them some basics of the law. And she she went, I thought, very effectively about that this is not a premeditation case and explaining what that meant. Can you tell us what she needs to prove here in terms of getting the top count of murder? Sure. So this uh, in Georgia, this defendant is charged with malice murder. So malice murder is when you have an intent to kill or uh, by either some expressed or implied uh, intent. And so um, and that is involving no considerable provocation. So whereas there was no reason why you would kill this person via self-defense or any other provocation, then we have malice murder, which uh, is a specific intent. Um, however, it does not have to be premeditated. Now, we're also looking at felony murder, which is the murder while in commission of a felony. So that's why you see the other charges, the aggravated assault and the aggravated battery. That's the foundation for the felony murder. So even if the jury finds that there was no specific intent to kill uh, Mr. Cog they can at least say that he was killed during the course of a felony. Well, that's a great breakdown. And by the way, that intent element, not premeditation, always you have to plan it out and plot it, that, that intent. That intent in Georgia can be formed still in, in moments or seconds. It doesn't have to even be something that's a long period of time. Is that right there? Yes, that's expressed or implied. And so uh, this is where the prosecution has the leeway to uh, mold the implication of intent. Uh, so using the circumstances, therefore, uh, they can develop that intent via implicit implicit intent. Okay, excellent. And, of course, the felony murder charge is always the prosecutor's best tool in the back pocket. Should you not be able to prove that intent? Kenny, a great explanation. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about felony murder, but we're going to throw back to the prosecutor's opening. I think she's doing a really effective job right now. And, Kenny, we'll talk to you about that on the other end. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I have Kenya Johnson with us. We're listening to the prosecutor's opening statement in Georgia versus Frankie Gebhardt. They're on lunch break now. What an excellent opportunity to speak to a skilled prosecutor with a homicide background. I love it here at the Law and Crime Network. Gavel to gavel coverage. And um, before I get to that, what I think to be excellent opening statement, because she just did a trick there um, that I think was very effective in front of the jury. I say a trick. She did a technique. But I want to quickly talk to you, Kenny, about felony murder and why that's the prosecutor's uh, ace card, because like you were saying, if you can't show intent, you've got that felony murder. Why is that so important for a prosecutor to have in terms of the ultimate outcome of the case? Uh, but, well, so with malice murder, you have to prove intent. And so intent is expressed or implied. But what you're trying to do is prove what someone was thinking at the time, which can oftentimes be difficult to do. So with a felony murder charge, that's based solely on circumstances, and you're not projecting someone's intent. So if they tied them up, if they beat them up, if they put the victim in a position, a very reckless, dangerous position, now we're talking about an act of aggravated battery or aggravated assault. And and that can form the basis for a felony murder. So basically, if you commit these felonies uh, and someone dies as a result of it, then you have the felony murder. You get away from the intent, and it's a great uh, alternative to malice murder. It's still murder. It still carries the same sentence, and it allows the prosecution a little room uh, to develop the facts of the case. That's one of the best analyses I've ever heard of a breakdown of the felony murder rule, Kenya. You were 100 percent on, on spot with that. Thank you. Uh, and it is true. It is something Sometimes it's difficult to prove the intent. 
in some cases. So you always have that. And it's a, felony murder is very controversial, but so our audience knows. It's not every felony. It's a list of what we call predicate felonies. And they're usually pretty serious felonies where somebody dies in the commission of that felony, even if you had no intention whatsoever that the person actually dies. Say, for example, in an armed robbery, one of your accomplices shoots and kills the victim. You, who may not have done that, could be convicted of felony murder because you were in the process of a felony where somebody died. Thank you, Kenya. Uh, we are here at the Law and Crime Network, and you know, Kenya, as a prosecutor, you know, as we have to put this case together, what folks don't understand is that there's lots of activity going on outside the courtroom. That we're in the courtroom, you, you got witnesses, you got victim witness people, you've got interviews going on. There's a lot of orchestration going on behind the scenes. But one thing you don't want to have happen to you when you're a prosecutor is being in the courtroom. Room and finding out that something went awry, like what happened today when one of the state's witnesses was sequestered from the courtroom. That is a, a very common thing that witnesses are not allowed to be in there to listen to either opening statements or other witnesses' testimony, so it's not biased. They're ordered to stay outside the courtroom, but apparently she was actually watching it on some sort of live feed, and the Law and Crime Network has actually captured uh, what happened when eventually this was found out and went before the judge and uh, as a result of that she violated a court order that is sequestration and we're going to go to the actual clip guess what happened to her well you're going to find out right now Kenya and we'll be on the other side talking about it no oh, here comes the judge uh, okay not all too happy about the fact that this woman, if I'm getting this right, and don't hold me to it, folks out there, but this is the daughter of Bill Moore. Bill Moore is a co-defendant in this case, and this case was separated and severed. We may talk a little bit about that later. I'm finding it hard to find out. I was having a little hard time hearing whether it was a defense witness or state witness, but since she was expected to testify shortly, it would seem to me she would be a state's witness. Either way, the judge is essentially saying, Kenya, that we told you you were not allowed to listen to any portion of the trial. You violated my order. Now you can go directly to jail for 20 days. I'm curious. In many states, you're entitled to a hearing at a certain point in time if there's going to be a consequence of magnitude with regard to a contempt citation of which going to jail is. Is that the same in Georgia or can he just say you go in and that's it? I think he just found her guilty of contempt. Uh, he asked that uh, she can, of course, hire her own counsel and put forth a defense as to why she didn't know she was sequestered. But this is such a big offense and could possibly have such a big impact on this trial based on what her testimony is that she had to be punished. And it also sends a message to the other witnesses that they are not to listen to other testimonies uh, because it can influence how they testify on the stand. So the judge uh, is really being punitive toward the state or the defense by prohibiting her testimony. Instead, he's going to uh, punish her individually. And he's also um, opened up the door for her to make an argument. He said he'll reconsider it after her testimony once he sees how important her testimony was to the trial and, uh, and how she acts going forward. But this was to send a message, and uh, hopefully everyone heard it loud and clearly. Yeah, you know, the judge may relent and, and may want to send a message. You you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about a case where I had one time where something like this had occurred, a violation of sequestration order, and I found out about it on cross-examination of the witness that could not have possibly known something that they were testifying to, uh, yet it was hurtful to my case. And then Doreen Cross admitted to the fact that another witness told them about what was testified in court. What happened there is that witness had to wind up taking the Fifth Amendment right to remain silent because they, a contempt is essentially a criminal charge which caused a mistrial in, in the whole case and eventually we were successful because that witness messed the whole case up. So uh, these are really serious issues there um, and, and that was a great explanation. Now with the defense opening, or rather the prosecution's opening, I just want to say one thing. Did you not find her to be very, uh, very smart in getting ahead of the evidence by saying this investigation in 1983 was shameful, it was incomplete? What that's telling me is that she knows she's got problems or holes, not that you can't navigate them, but she's coming out in front of it and saying that you're going to hear that. I think that is very effective to build your credibility with a jury. What were your thoughts? 
Absolutely. Well, it's the it's the elephant in the room. This case is over 30 years old, uh, and she owns their um, shortcomings in the case. We will not present a case as if it were uh, in real time. So we do have some uh, evidence or some things that may be missing. However, this is what we have, and we feel that it's enough to get a conviction. So uh, it was very appropriate for right. her to own the um, the shortcomings of her case. And that way, the uh, as the jury hears the evidence, expectations are already being managed. Well, I used to say to my uh, trial lawyers when I trained them as prosecutor, you dance with the one you brought. Don't be ashamed of it. Get out in front of it. Hey, Kenya, stay with us. Georgia prosecutor, can't get any better than that. Excellent legal analysis. But we're going to go to the defense openings and play some interesting clips, and we'll get back with Kenya on the other side to discuss it. From earlier today in Georgia versus Frankie Gebhardt, it is a murder case out of Georgia, a cold case from 1983 that broke many, many years later based on a tip and then multiple other tips that came afterwards. Uh, there were two defendants, uh, Bill Moore, who has been severed or separated from this case. We're going to get into that a little bit later. And Frankie Gebhardt, they were always kind of on the police radar, but these tips assisted. And what you heard there, Kenya, is the defense attorney basically using the air, quote, uh, jailhouse informant bit. Uh, many times with cold cases, if you are dogged as a prosecutor or police officer, somebody who has an interest in helping themselves out down the road may very well have the data, and that could be usually in the context of a jail informant uh, or somebody who wants to help themselves out that got jammed up later on and can actually solve a case, but they don't necessarily come with stellar records. What are you seeing in that, and has that been your experience as a prosecutor, and what do you do to get around that issue with the jury? So you take your witnesses as you find them. And again, sometimes they are not the most honorable people in society, but they witnessed a crime and they have something to share. So, of course, the defense attorney is trying to minimize the credibility of those jailhouse informants. And it'll be up to the prosecutor to show uh, the motivation as to why this jailhouse informant came forward at this time with this information and to uh, bolster or at least to uh, influence and, and show that they are credible in some way that, that a reduced sentence may not have been on the line or some personal gain may not have been the line on the line but the truth is is many cases are solved by witnesses uh, and if they find themselves in jail and that's when they decide to tell the truth uh, that's something that we have to deal with as prosecutors you, you know and a lot of people forget that sometimes the, it's just the credibility and what the jury perceives if they're sitting there and listening to one of these jailhouse informants testify my whole case one time on a murder relied upon a jailhouse informant. I think one of the funniest things I've ever seen was a very effective cross-examination by the defense attorney about his 60 and 70 criminal convictions that he had. And when he finally said, so you expect this jury to believe you, which was a mistake to ask an open-ended question like that, the guy said, hey, I may be a career criminal, but I'm not a liar. And the jury broke out laughing guilty all the way down the line. Kenya, I love having you on. Uh, you gave us great, uh, great information. We're going to go back to a little bit more of this defense opening and talk about some other little tactics that the defense lawyer did in front of that jury that could be at least effective in creating some doubt in at least one juror's mind. Welcome back to the Law of Crime Network. Um, we, we got some great competing narratives here, uh, Kenya. They're on lunch break right now. We have this great opportunity. Um, I, I don't know what your feelings are, but as a prosecutor, if I have physical evidence that can be tested, even if I don't think that that evidence is going to yield results like DNA and a database that's out there that law enforcement uses all the time, I do that testing just so that what's happening right now with the defense attorney saying they basically, when it didn't match the people, they rushed to uh, charge them and assumed it was the victims. Uh, and this case is about who did it. I really think that's an effective strategy. DNA doesn't lie. Why didn't they do it? What do you think about the defense opening? Was it effective? 
Well, the defense is there to plant doubt. They have to uh, promote reasonable doubt and show where that is occurring. So they're already planting the seeds. And when you start to begin to hear uh, some of the physical testimony ab about the physical evidence, uh, they want the jury to then already be suspicious and questioning. So defense attorney is doing what defense attorneys do. Uh, and it's just up to the state to either stay on course and present their evidence in the neatest possible uh, way that they can and argue any shortcomings in closing. Uh, but this is just par for the course. This is a trial. There are two sides and we're seeing all those two sides. Well, you know, I personally uh, will take a little disagreement with you there, although I respect what you're saying. As a prosecutor, to me, you test that DNA because you may find that you were wrong. Or you do it simply because you can avoid the argument that's being made right now. I've never understood why prosecutors have these tools at their disposal and they don't utilize them and subject themselves to the possibility that somebody else did it. Because we know DNA has cleared people who have been convicted of crimes and be released from jail. I, I don't think that that's a, a defense trick. I think it's a substantive question mark that I would have in my head both as a prosecutor and a defense attorney. It's something that the prosecution is going to have to answer. If the evidence was available for testing, uh, then they should test it. And I do agree. However, um, it's something that will have to be dealt with. Otherwise, the defense will uh, hammer in in their closing uh, why this case, why the state did not prove their case. Yeah, okay. Well, listen, uh, this is great stuff, and we really appreciate your opinion. Kenya, right down there in Georgia, homicide experience yourself. Unfortunately or fortunately, we're just going to have to take a short little break. And on the other end of that, we're going to come back with more law and crime gavel to gavel coverage. We're on lunch break in the Frankie Gebhard case. It's fascinating already, folks. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. We have Kenya Johnson with us from Georgia talking about one case, but Listen, we had lit that Marine murder case with Quincinio Canada and Dewan Malazam, uh, who was uh, really a, it's a fascinating case that's going on still right now that we're covering on the Law and Crime Network. But the producers and great staff here, and it really is an amazing staff, have put a package together so that we can get a, a little bit of a sense of that entire case for those of you who may not have been following it uh, very specifically. And we're going to get back to Kenya on the other end of that with respect to this fascinating trial. But let's see a little recap in the Malazam case. The Kentucky trial of the shooting death of a Marine is underway. 26-year-old Quincinio Canada and 34-year-old Dewan Mulazam are charged with murder and assault for an incident outside a bar in 2014. The two men allegedly approached Corporal Jonathan Price and his wife Megan when one of them tried to snatch her purse. When Jonathan got involved, a fight started and the corporal was fatally shot in the back. Megan suffered a non-fatal bullet wound to her leg. Both men are also charged for a robbery six days prior to the price shooting. Law enforcement connected them to both crimes by identifying the 45 caliber handgun used in the robbery and the shooting. For Law and Crime, I'm Rachel Stockman. I'm, I'm sure you were following. I think actually you may have been commenting a little bit uh, on that case, the Malazam case. Uh, you know, it's it, you know as a homicide prosecutor, you know it, it's it's you. It's really hard to listen to these stories where, you know, people are otherwise living their lives peaceably, you know, minding their own business, and then out of nowhere, uh, death occurs. And it is, it's so hard uh, not only to prosecute the case, but to kind of process the whole thought of it. But you just do, and you do one, and you do another one, and you do another one. And I think it's only later in my career when I'm doing more of the news aspect of it that my old homicide cases kind of come back to haunt me. Do you find that as a professional, you kind of just, it's like the mail, it just keeps on coming and you, you just keep on handling it, but isn't these, aren't these stories really sad? Yes, as a prosecutor, our lives are crime and punishment, and um, and you take that back home with you, and you want to do a good job. You want to do a good job for the victims, for the victims' families, and so during the hard times when it becomes so emotionally overbearing, I just remember that our mission is to protect the public and to uh, get justice for the victims, and that helps me stay the course. And, you know, uh, just real quick before we actually do, I want to go to a little bit of a defense opening in that case, but... 
I, I always used to tell the victims' families in homicide cases, because it's just been my experience, I'm curious as to what your experience is, that at the end of the day, there's fight in them. They, they want to see justice, quote unquote. They, they like to see more than justice, to be honest with you. But they, they, they want that court process. But at the end, it's always a hollow victory. And, and I always sense that there's guilty, 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 and there's a moment of elation. And then they walk out of that courtroom and nobody else is paying attention any longer. And then there's like depression. Have you noticed that kind of cycle? I have noticed that, however, um, even after the trial and regardless of the outcome, it allows the families oftentimes to have closure mm -hmm. and that helps in their grieving process. And even though it is a hollow victory, uh, they can have some reassurances that the person who committed the crime is in custody and can't hurt others, uh, but you can never bring back the victim. And so any way to help the victims through uh, their families through that grieving process, uh, I'm willing to take the case to trial and to seek that justice, whether we win or lose, uh, it's the fight. The justice and the glory is in the fight. Amen to that. And I also think that it's very important as whether you're a prosecutor or a defense lawyer, that we see the bigger picture of what's happening in these cases, especially as a prosecutor, and that we also take care and time and concern for them as people as opposed to just witnesses and victims. And that has been an evolution, at least in my career. Um, and I think it's becoming more and more important. And I think in the end analysis, they respect the fact that you cared more than the fact that you were necessarily successful or unsuccessful in a verdict. Do you agree with that? I do, and I stay in touch with uh, some families that I've uh, developed a relationship with. You can't be this intimately involved in the lives of others without forming some sort of bond. And while we may not speak regularly, I can name off several cases and people's names to whom I think about and, uh, and to whom I developed a relationship with. That's right, me too. All right, listen, let's go to the defensing, defense opening in that case, and on the other end of it, discuss it a little bit more intimately with respect to everything that's going on in that courtroom where the Marine was actually shot in the back and killed. His wife was shot uh, and, and left uh, watching her husband die. A very powerful and dramatic testimony. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. So that is the Marine murder case and the defense opening. Um, we debated this, Kenya Johnson, um, a, a lot with Mike Argelish and um, Dan Shore. I thought the defense lawyer did a very uh, credible job at bringing out facts in a, in a case that typically the defense does the, uh, the American flag and talks about proof beyond a reasonable doubt and the presumption of innocence, usually throws in an analogy there about some sort of soup or pasta or whatever that and have with a bridge, you know, whatever they use to try to draw these tortured analogies. But she was getting very specific in what they, they didn't do and the assumptions they made. And I thought she was pretty confident. Others disagreed with that. What were your thoughts? Um, she does sound very confident and in just listening, if you just listened to her closing argument, you would have that doubt. Uh, but the jury has had the opportunity to listen to the entire trial and the openings and, uh, and they'll hear the prosecution closing, which, uh, as the having had the burden of proof, the prosecution will likely finish the uh, last of the closing arguments and hopefully they'll be able to bring around all the, uh, anything in involving, um, the case that that may not have been the strongest for the prosecution. So while the defense was very specific, um, the prosecution will come back and talk about the things that they feel make the connections to this crime and the defendants. Yeah, Kenya, one uh, last point real quick before we throw to an actual witness in that trial that we want to uh, do a little discussion about is that one of the defense attorneys in the case that was representing a different defendant chose not to give an opening statement. I have never seen that in all the years that I've tried cases, period, uh, whether they're homicide or other things. I find it to be puzzling to me. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, it's certainly a missed opportunity to tell your side of the story early on, but it is something that I've seen before. Uh, they just want to allow the state to give all their evidence, and then they, and usually that's when they feel so strongly that the evidence is uh, doesn't reach 
the uh, there's so much reasonable doubt that they almost feel like they don't have to say anything or to color the evidence that would be presented at trial. But the truth is, is it's certainly a missed opportunity. As a defense attorney, I would want each and every time that I was allowed it to tell the jury that this case uh, doesn't rise to a conviction. Right. I mean, we, we teach all the time. Primacy and recency are very, very important as prosecutors and even defense lawyers. You try to jam your uh, non, you know, important stuff in the middle so that you can get the powerful stuff in the beginning and the end. And the same thing with a trial. The opening statement is, in my estimation, the most important part of the case because it sets the tone. And, and there is stuff for the defense to argue in this case. We know that the defense attorney we were just talking about was doing an effective job, especially with respect to the issue of DNA. Uh, I was talking previously about this, that even if you just got up there and said something which could have been very powerful, thank you for your time, thank you for your service, by the way, DNA doesn't come back to these guys, I got nothing left to say, see you at summation. I mean, at least say something, build some credibility. I think it was a lost opportunity. And, and Kenny, we had a witness there, a Shane uh, uh, Hansford, uh, whose gun was stolen uh, from him. This is his gun, this is this, uh, the robbery that occurred, a gun was later exchanged.